Ooh, I can just feel my unconscious bias. Very itchy today. Anyway, I'd like to apologise in advance if I seem a tad subdued this evening. But when I received a WhatsApp message from my producer first thing this morning saying, remember, the Harry and Meghan documentary comes out today, we'll need to cover it, enjoy, followed by a winking face emoji, I can't say that my heart leapt. So today I have spent more time than I would have liked getting to know the real Harry and Meghan. Again, for those who missed the Oprah interview. So if I'm a bit miffed, it's because it bores me to tears giving these two airtime. Well, for one thing, the Markles don't really need to keep stabbing the monarchy in the front as they do in this documentary gently but persistently, as our own King Charles, doing his best Neville Chamberlain impression, seems to be appeasing this thousand-year-old sacred institution to ground all by himself, with the way he's dealing with Marlene's entrapment of Lady Hussey and Lady Hussey's subsequent necessary and immediate sacrifice at the altar of white supremacy. On the plus side, I do have to say the documentary is rather well made. H, as he's called, is engaging and much more relaxed in private than when he's in public, and one does feel for him in part. Meghan gives a masterpiece in how to gently undermine every custom Britain holds dear. Well, they both do, actually. Racism. Brexit. Really, Harry? Do better, mate. As is always the case with these two, the conversation turns often and always to race. And once it's there, it's unable to move on. Megan keeps going on about being black, which is so strange because A, she isn't, she's mixed race, and B, she looks to some people who are now too scared to ask where people are from, like she comes from Spain or Italy or somewhere like that. That's the problem with all this endless skin hewing. It invites division and the Markles are there to pick up the cash. There is nothing more depressing than this never-ending hand-wringing about race and unconscious bias, which, by the way, is called ghost hunting to you and me, that so-called progressives are so keen on, especially seeing as the only open and acceptable form of racism permitted in the public sphere in the United Kingdom nowadays is against white people, lucky us, who the documentary spends a good amount of time denigrating by a thoughtfully soft-focused, rather snide interjections from extremely high-end race countries like David Olasunga and privately educated, supremely privileged Afwa Hirsch. These aren't budget airline race baiters like Yasmin Alabai Brown or Dr. Schoeller on this gig. This is the real deal. It is achingly slick as the piano mourns along. It's a compliment to the Markle's everyday woes. And in many ways, it does exactly the job it's trying to do. Paint the two protagonists as victims whose suffering is permanent and unbearable. And it is the British press... And the British public's fault, because yes, you guessed it, once more for those at the back, you're all massive racists. However, spinning this Sussex yarn does require some careful omissions to keep the narrative on track. Allegations about Princess Diana being handed to death by the paparazzi, for example, rather than died at the hands of a drunk driver of the Mercedes she was so unfortunate to get inside. They come early on, and there is no footage of the well-wishers, dozens deep, offering their cheers at Harry and Meghan's wedding. Well, not at least so far as where I've got to in the documentary before I needed to take a very, very long breather. I don't really have much else to say. I've had a few cameras shoved in my face over the years, and yes, it's unpleasant. I've also received horrible tweets and newspaper articles and people threatening to unload shotguns into my face, which isn't particularly enjoyable either. But this is the digital age, and the Markles are not unique in suffering the downsides of what life in the public eye brings, much as Meghan would love it if they were. Perhaps, who knows, they might both benefit from developing what we used to call a bit of a stiff upper lip. And trying to find time to enjoy the great privileges this genuinely progressive world has afforded them, rather than unloading about the unbearable systemic oppression which weighs so heavily upon them as they desperately try to lead a quiet, private life in their $30 million Montecito mansion in front of the eyes of millions on Netflix.